I am happy, even though no one's online yet to listen to this, they might hear it later, but I am happy because this is the third day in a row, three in a row, that I, third day, motion with my left hand, third day in a row I've gotten to teach a Bible study. And I want you to know a little secret how to keep uh, Pastor Brown happy. If you want to know how to uh, maintain your Pastor Brown in a good mood, let him teach plenty of Bible studies. So this is the third day in a row of Bible study. The third day in a row I will get to draw something on my nice, happy, big whiteboard, and I am happy. Life is good. Um, other random little note before I begin. My humorous thing. I have ordered myself a Fitbit. Because I've been trying to walk more. I'm trying, uh, I am going to try to lose weight. I am instituting a no eating after seven at night. So no more snacking, that'll be good. And so I got a Fitbit to keep track of walking so I, don't, I can get stuff tracked off even when I don't have my phone with me. And I saw that some people apparently wear their Fitbits around their ankle. And my thoughts on that are, are twofold. One, that would make it really hard to check the time. <laughs> Two, man, COVID's got us all feeling like prisoners for wearing ankle bracelets now for moderate exercise. So. With that all said, there's my happy little introduction. We're going to be starting up again, uh, as there's no massive storm that's come through today and knocked out power. We're going to be at Jeremiah chapter 37. And if you will recall, where we are at is we're right at the verge of the fall of Jerusalem. I want to go back to the dating that I've got up on the board. Uh, Jeremiah really starts preaching in... Well, that's really bad. 622. And starts warning the people of Jerusalem that bad things are coming. Y'all need to repent. In 605, Babylon defeats Jerusalem for the first time. And that's when they take the first wave of exiles over. Like the folks in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ezekiel. And Jeremiah is the prophet who stays behind in Jerusalem, preaching to the people of Jerusalem. And finally in 586, game over. That, that's when they get wiped out. And where we're at is we're in the end game. We're like at 588, 587. The writing is on the wall, even though that's technically in, in the book of Daniel. But it, it, it's wrapping up. And so we're, we're going to be dealing with some of the intense um, problems that come up towards the end. So, but then we'll get a turn as well. So, uh, if you have questions, feel free to type them up. I am sitting close enough. I've put my big Bible right here where I can actually see the things, and they're right under my, my face, which is kind of interesting. But we'll carry on. So, I will take a sip of coffee. If you have any questions, please type them now quickly while I, while I sip my lovely coffee by Gillespie. I'm still having coffee at 7 o'clock at night, and I think this will... When I finish this cup, I will finish off a pot today. I want to lose weight. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Energy! All right. <laughs> Gotta laugh about life. All right. Jeremiah chapter 37. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord that he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. Now think about the setup. Jerusalem is conquered. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just go wipe everything out. He takes out the one who would have been on the line and he puts another royal up in place. Why do you normally do that? Well, let us go back several hundred years years and imagine we have a feudal system and I'm a king and I take over I come in from outside and I conquer the the dukedom of Persia and I take out the current king and I take out the current person who's been lying to inherit and instead I put a cousin on the throne that cousin would not be king if it were not for me he would not be the duke without for me that means he owes his position to me he should be giving me at least a bit a modicum of loyalty Nope, doesn't happen. 
There, there's no gratitude from Zedekiah. There's no sense of reality. There's no loyalty either to God, nor is there even the simple practical reality of my bread got buttered by Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe I ought not want to tick Nebuchadnezzar off. Because if he put me on the throne, I'm sure he thinks he can put me off of the throne. Zedekiah is not only impious, he is politically dumb and arrogant. So that's the setting. That's who we're dealing with. King Zedekiah set Jehuchal, the son of Shemeleka, and Zephaniah the priest, the son of Masiah, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Please pray for us to the Lord our God. Now, Jeremiah was still going in and out among the people, for he had not yet been put into prison. No, we've backed up. We're, this is one of the things that is frustrating. The book of Jeremiah isn't in chronological order. It's telling stories. It, it's, it's ordered in the way that you might order sitting around telling stories with your buddy about the bad times you went through. Uh, four years from now, when we're telling stories about what we did during lockdown, we might not necessarily go in chronological order. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, the army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard the news, they withdrew from Jerusalem. This is one of the things. Jerusalem was trying to play Egypt off of, off of Babylon and so, so on and so forth. And so it looked like things are going well. So like, all right, go pray for us now to see things are going well. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt to its own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord, do not deceive yourself, saying, The Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of the Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained only of them wounded men, every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. You aren't getting your way out of this. Egypt is not going to save you. Trust not in princes, they are but mortal. Mm. Verse 11. Now when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion there among the people. When he was at the Benjamin Gate, that would be the gate going out south towards Benjamin, a sentry there named Irajah, the son of Shelemiah, son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah the prophet, saying, You are deserting to the Chaldeans. And Jeremiah said, It's a lie, not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Irajah would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And the officials were enraged at Jeremiah, and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, for it had been made a prison. And then there's mass injustice. Jeremiah's going on off uh, to go take care of family business. He, he's of the clan of Benjamin. He's going to go out to the family farm and make sure stuff is going on. And Oh, no, you're leaving. Obviously, you want to be a traitor. Okay. Uh, why does my Bible say Babylonian? That is actually a good question. And I'm going to put it up over here. The Chaldeans and the Babylonians are basically the same thing. Uh, Chaldean is the ancient name for them. Um, Abraham came from Chaldea. That it's that area of, of what we would call today Iraq. Um, I'm not sure why your Bible does it that way, but I believe, and I, I don't have my Hebrew in front of me because my Hebrew is just not that good, the more accurate term to use is Chaldean. That's what's being used. And I think that's being highlighted to, to throw back to Abraham. If you're going to have to pick one or the other, the Chaldeans or the Egyptians, well, the children of Abraham are strongly Chaldean. There's some, some Egyptian influence, but we, we, we lean to the north and not to, to Egypt. 
So there, there is some, I think, highlighting that goes on with that in Hebrew. However, that sounds really confusing to most modern American readers because we think of the problem being Babylon. So it, it, it's, it would sort of be like um, whether you refer to uh, the people in England as the Brits or the English. Because technically, only a small portion of them are Britons, and that's the older term for them, and they are now England. But but they both kind of refer to the same thing. So if you were translating that into a, a story, you'd have to... Uh, really? Okay, you probably have the NIV Concordia Self-Study Bible. Uh, we're, I'm reading out of the Lutheran Study Bible, and that's the difference. The NIV tends to go for a more readily understood translation. The ESV tends to be slightly more literal, wooden, and um, technical in how it will translate things. And this is an example of where you, you get that distinction. Um, NIV probably just wanted to keep referring to them as Babylonians all the way through, whereas the ESV will say, if they call them Brits here, we'll call them Brits. If they call them English, we'll call them English. Instead of just saying, We'll just pick one term and use it all the way through. So that, that would be what I am guessing is the rationale. Um, the NIV is a very fine translation. There are times I have qualms with it, but there are times I have qualms with every translation because I'm persnickety. So, but the ESV just tends to be a little bit more... So, um, hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to pick on up. Starting up again at verse 16. I hope that kind of gets for that distinction. They're the same thing. It would sort of be like saying, um, a, another example might be, um, if we put this in terms of the Civil War, why are you defecting to the North or why are you defecting to the Yanks? Well, if you're an American growing up, you're going to be perfectly aware that when someone in the South calls someone a Yankee, that that's a, a derogatory type of bleh. Whereas if you're dealing with someone from Spain who's reading a translation that you might just want to keep the same terminology all the way through and not broach that issue. So that, that's what I'm guessing went on with the NIV. So translation is the fun art. 16. When Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah said, there is. Then he said, you shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. <laughs> Jeremiah also said to King Zedekiah, what wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you've put me into prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you saying, the king of Babylon will not come against you and against this land? Now here, please, O my lord, the king, let my humble plea come before you and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan, the secretary, lest I die there. So Zedek, King Zedekiah gave orders, and they committed Jeremiah to the court of the guard. And a loaf of bread was given him daily from the Baker Street until all the bread of the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. So Zedekiah calls Jeremiah and says, uh, you got anything from God? Yeah, I've got something from God. You're going to lose. Now don't send me back to jail because I was right. Your prophets that you listened to were wrong. I'm going to go die in that guy's house because it's a lousy prison. And Zedekiah relents a little bit. He puts Jeremiah in a different place, uh, in the court of the guard. So instead of just the, the hastily put together prison that everyone gets forgotten about in, he gets put in the nice one. He actually gets some of the food, some of the daily ration of the food because the city is under siege. So it, it's better for Jeremiah, but he's still unjustly in prison. And the injustice continues chapter 38. Uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to type them and I'll, I'll address them as they come on up. Now, Shephatiah, pause. I'm just imagining my head having Don read this in Bible study. All right, just because these are fun. And these are, these are names that you don't normally get coming up the rest of the time in, in the scriptures because they're really just involved around here and they aren't necessarily heroes, so people won't get, don't get named them again. So, Now, Jephthah, the son of Matan, 
Gedaliah, the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malkiah, heard the word that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes up to the Chaldean shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and war. Thus is the Lord, this city shall surely be given to the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the official said to the king, Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. Jeremiah is prophesying bad things. Let's kill him. Now, this again, tactically, is bad. If you are a city under siege and people have the opportunity to get out of the city and go over, that's fine. Let them out. Let them go because let's say you have a city of, of 50,000 people and you've got maybe 10,000 soldiers and 40,000 civilians and the civilians are worried about if 20,000 of the civilians want to run away, great. That means you have less people to feed. There'll be the, the problem with the Chaldean army. You want to get the people out of the town in a siege. If you have people that are willing to go towards the besiegers, and the besiegers are going to at least keep up the pretense of, we're here for your good, that's what you want to do. But the problem is these advisors are thinking with their ego. They want to be puffed up. They want to do bluster. They're not thinking rationally. They're not thinking tactically. They're not dealing with what you want to do. You don't need the civilians there. Get the civilians out. But this is ego. And I'm a big man because I'm in charge of all these people. And if all these people aren't here, then I'm not nearly as big a man anymore. So they're lousy and they want to kill Jeremiah. It, it's bad. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him to the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank in the mud. So what do they do? We'll toss him in a, a cistern that's run dry. Hey, you, you prophesied that we'd be stuck here and besieged? Well, guess what? You would have drowned, but we're out of water. But still, you'll die before we do, because we have other cisterns. And again, we can say technically we didn't kill you, we just let you drown. This is, again, this is how you get rid of people if you don't like them in the ancient world. You drop them to a well and walk off and let them take their chances. However, God is not done with Jeremiah yet. When Abed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. The king was sitting in the Benjamin gate. Abed-Melech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded Abed-Melech the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Abed-Melech took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse and took from there old rags and worn-out clothes by which he, let, uh, which he let down to Jeremiah and the cistern by ropes. Then Abed-Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And then they drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Do you see how, how this is just a matter of really bad kingship? We're going to kill Jeremiah. Oh, I can't do anything to stop you. This is terrible. They're killing Jeremiah. Oh, well, go rescue him. This is not decisive leadership. This is not a king who is thinking solid. This is a king who's flying by the seat of his pants and just utterly weak, and yet trying to be strong and blustering and trying to... Just, do you get a sense of how chaotically bad this is? It's not a matter of uh, faithful people in the court decided to go do a rescue around the, behind the king's back. It's, no, we actually told the king. 
just utterly dumb. And you might think at this point that Jeremiah would say, that's it, I'm being quiet, no more, I, I, I'm Seacrest out. That's not what happened. Verse 14, 38, 14. King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the Lord. The king said that that would be the king's private entrance. So he's doing this privately. The king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you a question. Hide nothing from me. Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, If I tell you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you counsel, you will not listen to me. Then King Zedekiah swore secretly to Jeremiah, As the Lord lives, who made our souls, I will not put you to death or deliver you into the hand of these men who seek your life. Ah, okay. Susan asked a good question. And it, it's close to accurate, but it's slightly off. Um, Susan asked, what is the rank of a eunuch that he could go against the king? What we hear about him is that he is a eunuch in the king's house. That means he's an official advisor. And one of the things that comes up is when you had eunuchs in the ancient world, they generally were highly trusted advisors. Uh, we come across the famous uh, eunuch uh, in Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch, another Ethiopian eunuch. But he was a eunuch who was in the court at Ethiopia. He was the treasurer. How to put it? Uh, basically, in the ancient world, if you had someone that you wanted to trust but didn't want to be a rival because they were highly competent, but you wanted to keep them around, you castrated them. Because then they weren't going to be messing with your women. And they don't have their own family, that they're, their own progeny that they're going to be worried about trying to set up. They're bound to you. So basically he is, I'd say a slave to the king, but that has so many con uh, connotations of we think of slaves as utterly servile. He's, he is a combination slave and trusted advisor. All these other advisors who have power plays and wanted to take out Jeremiah, they had other irons in the fire. They had things to do in the future. They had future plans to make. Ebed Melech, being as he is a eunuch, is fundamentally tied to the king. So he, it's, he, he's, he's the guy that can be honest with the king and deal with him bluntly. That, that's the role of a eunuch. Um, in the West, you almost might think of it as like the court jester, where, where the jester could be bluntly honest with the king in a way that other people wouldn't. Because the jester's son isn't going to take over as the duke of whatever. It, there, there, there's no political authority that's going to be granted outside of the role that that jester has with the, the king. That's the same idea sort of with what a, a eunuch would be, but they just kind of set it in snow, stone. So, um, it... It does show that Zedekiah as a king is really weak. He is, he's not secure on the throne, again, because he's been put there by Babylon. And so as he, he's having to placate the folks who want to overthrow Babylon, but even so in doing, he weakens himself. And, okay, I can't go against you because you're my main support. And going, it, it's, it's a lousy situation. He doesn't have many people he can trust. So... Um, at any rate, after all this, Zedekiah finally says, no, tell me straightly, I promise I won't kill you. Verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then the city will be given to the hands of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from your hand. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans. 
lest I be handed over to them and they deal with deal cruelly with me. And Jeremiah said, You shall not be given over to them. Obey now the voice of the Lord and what I say to you, and that shall be well with you, and your life shall be spared. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the vision which the Lord has shown me. Behold, all the women left in the house of the king of Judah were being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon, and were saying, Your trusted friends have deceived you and prevailed against you. Now that your feet are sunk in the mud, they turn away from you. All your wives and your sons shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this king shall be burned with fire. So here's the situation. You need to cut it off. You need to give up. Surrender now. That's the only way you're going to get out of this alive. The king says, no, I'm worried about, because if they left the city and they went out, they, they might not like me. They might be really mad at me for having set up this whole policy that got the Chaldeans angry. And they might try to uh, uh, win favor with the Chaldeans by taking me out. No. Slow your roll. This is above political pay grade. This is what God has said. Surrender, you live. Don't surrender, you die. It's as simple as that. That is the word of the Lord. Do it. But what about, no, 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 no. I didn't stutter. This is what God said. You deal with what God said. Quit worrying about all the other things that you might want to think about. God has set out the choice before you. You have the option. You surrender and live. You don't surrender, you die. Ball's in your court, King. 38.24 Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. If the officials hear that I have spoken with you and come to you and say to you, tell us what you said to the king and what the king said to you, hide nothing from us and we will not put you to death. Then you shall say to them, I made a humble plea to the king that he would not send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. Then all the officials came to Jeremiah and asked him, and he answered them as the king had instructed him. So they stopped speaking with him, for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. The king asked Jeremiah to keep this on the QT. Here, here's, here's what we talked about. If anyone asked, you just said, don't send me out. What that does, that lets the king save a little face. It doesn't, he's able to say, I, I'm confident, I'm projecting a position of power, I'm not, it keeps Jeremiah safe because now he's not the rabble rouser trying to get the king to surrender when all these other people want to kill him because he's supporting the enemy or what have you. So it's actually a wise thing that the king does here. It, okay, maybe not wise. The wise thing would have been said, you're right, I hear the word of the Lord, everyone's going to hear the word of the Lord, and we're going to surrender. But at least this is somewhat sensible, and it's going to go bad. And as we get ready to move to chapter 39, we're going to get to the fall of Jerusalem finally. Um, I'm going to pause and, and wait for questions, but while folks might be writing a question, I, I, I want to just note that this is, we can't imagine it in terms of what this would be like. Um, I, I mean, it, it wouldn't even be, it, it would be like our country being conquered, but inconceivable, even more so. Even with all the warning, Surely, surely we're going to get out of this. Surely we're going to... And so this is the climactic bad event of the Old Testament. This is as low as it gets. And, and in many ways, it's even lower than the, the later destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which is utterly horrific. Because from here on, Jerusalem's never independent. There's never really an independent kingdom of Israel or kingdom of Judah. It's always conquered territory. And even when battle, even when Jerusalem falls to the Romans in 70 AD, it's just the Romans who had taken us over, smacked us around because we were misbehaving. There, there's the, the whole sense of independence and, and pride in our own nation is messed up. Did Jeremiah have families, the question? I'm not sure. 
I, th I think he had cousins and stuff, but I don't think he had a wife and children. Not that I know of. I could be wrong. I don't recall hearing anything about that. So I, I'm not answering confidently, but I'm answering from, I, I don't think he has kids. I, I'm not sure. Let's read more and we'll find out. Enough. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for anything more about Jeremiah's immediate family. But I think it's more mainly his cousins and such like that. He could very well have a, a wife and kids. I wouldn't be surprised. But we don't, I, I, I can't think of any mention so far. Let's take out Jerusalem. Chapter 39. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, on the ninth day of the month, July 29th, 1587, A breach was made in the city. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came and sat in the middle gate, near Galsar Ezer, Samgar Nebu, Sarsekim, the Rab Saris, near Galsar Ezer, the Rab Mag, and with all the rest of the officers of the king of Babylon. When Zedekiah, king of Judah, and all the soldiers saw them, they fled, going out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls. And they went towards the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, at Riblah, in the land of Hamath. And he passed sentence on him. The king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah at Riblah before his eyes. The king of Babylon slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. He put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Then Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile to Babylon the rest of the people who were left in the city, those who had deserted to him and the people who had remained. Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. There's the fall. Nope, they don't surrender, and, and the nobles are wiped out. And Nebuchadnezzar is ticked, and he's cold. All right, the last thing you see is going to be your children being slaughtered, and then I'm going to take out your eyes. I'm going to drag you in chains to Babylon, where you will be a warning to anyone else who thinks about rebelling against me. This is why you don't rebel. And yet, there's something here at the end that, that is interesting. The poor people who had nothing. Congratulations, you have vineyards. You have fields. Now, they're poor, they're not well-trained, so they're not likely to come up and be rebellious. They're not going to be organized. But the land's not going to go fallow. It'll still be productive. There will be at least some benefit to Babylon for having done this conquering. We'll get some produce out of it, some wine. Great. But it falls, and it, it's... it's it's lousy. And, it, and again, it's something that would have all been preventable if only people had listened to the word of the Lord. But again, so much of Scripture is if only people had listened to the word of the Lord. And they don't, and it goes poorly. I'll keep reading at verse 11. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him. Look after him well and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is used to interacting with, with, with Israelites back in Babylon. He knows Daniel. He knows of Ezekiel. He, he knows that, that the Lord God has prophets. And you don't mess with the prophets. Ah, there's Jeremiah the prophet. You're going to treat him well. Leave him among the poor. Do well by him and don't mess with him, all right, local guy? Because you're the guy who's going to be running the place after I drag everyone off, okay? So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, 
Nebushaban, the Rab Saris, Nergal Sar Ezer, the Rab Mag, and all the chief officers of the king of Babylon sent him to Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to Gedaliah, the son of Achim, the son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Thus is the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will fulfill my words against the city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given to the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I shall, will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword. But you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Ponder this very quickly. Um, know what the king does, or had done. He ran away and abandoned people in the city. He snuck out with the officials, and because they sneak out and do not surrender, they die. But, well, the eunuch, he's, he's in Jerusalem, and he surrenders. And what happens? He lives. God shows mercy even in the midst of the fall of Jerusalem, which is astonishing. So, um, I'm actually going to suggest that we pause here. Because what's going to happen now is we're going to get into the, the, the politics of what goes on after the fall of Jerusalem. And it, it's one of the things where you would think that this would be the end of the story, that, that people would say, all right, that's it, we messed up doesn't happen. Jeremiah is still going to end up having more work to do. He's still going to cause more problems. There's still going to be more chaos. And I'd rather get a start on that next week. And um, I, I know this one's been a little bit shorter than we could be, but we, we did get three chapters done. And so next week we can start up at chapter 40 and get to some of the, the post-fall politicking. But just so we aren't quite done in just 35 minutes, just some, some thoughts on the, the three chapters we've gone through. Um, you perhaps may be frustrated by the state of politics in the U.S. today, or in the state of Illinois, or the state of wherever you happen to reside. One of the things that is comforting about the scriptures is that they deal with real history and real hard times, and they don't paint flattering pictures. Uh, our stories are not from Never Never Land. They're from real places and real history. And things being messy is nothing new. And God gets his people through it. God preserves the people who are faithful to him. And not just in this life, but he preserves us for eternal life through Christ Jesus, his son, our Lord. And even the, the utter tomfoolery of, of kings on the throne of David cannot stop his plan of salvation, cannot stop the true son of David, Christ Jesus, from coming and being our redeemer. And so that is the, the perspective, the thing that we remember that we have in the back of our head whenever we see this, is the thing we should remember whenever we go look around at the world around us, that, that there remains great and solid and sure hope. So, with that being said, see you in the morning at 8.30, because we're, we're going to be doing stuff at 8.30 still, and uh, we'll do devotional in the morning, and we'll close on up. So I'm going to go get ready to head on home and possibly get to bed early, I think, because I've not been sleeping super well. That, uh, that power outage threw off my sleep schedule something fierce, so we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll finally get to bed early. I keep thinking, I should go to bed early and then don't fall asleep, so, and I still wake up early, so we'll see. So uh, let us pray for a good evening, and then we'll be about our business, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the care and compassion that you've always shown to your people, even in the midst of hard times and tragic times. We ask that you make us always mindful of the great promises you have made to us, that your Son, Christ Jesus, is indeed our Savior, and that we are rescued from sin and death 
on account of his own death and resurrection. Make us ever mindful of the gifts you have given us, teach us to be appreciative of them, and make us ever more attentive to your word, that we might not trust in our own plans, but always rather trust in the salvation that you have in store for us. Be with us this night, give us nights of rest and peace, and guide and direct us on the morrow, so that all that we do and say would be pleasing in your sight. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Exactly. If I go to bed earlier, I won't eat. The, the, the positive side on, on trying to go to bed early and not snacking is uh, Celia and I finished the TV show we were watching. We finished the show New Tricks, which is a, a British drama, cop sort of drama. But uh, we, we took a slight detour and started watching the, the best home, Britain's best home cook. And that was bad for not wanting to snack at night. You just can't watch food cooking competition shows and not want to snack. So that was a, that, that kind of knocked me off my two week, uh, my two week habit. But I, I'm getting back on track and we can deal with hunger for a bit and then the stomach will shrink and we'll be back to normal or back to good positive, drop some weight off. So. With that being said, I am going to go home and go to bed. Well, or at least lay down and read and maybe watch some non-food cooking shows. So, Have a good night, everyone, and Lord willing, I'll see you on the morrow. Bye.